healthcare uh, or, or particularly any type of procedure. And our experience has told us time and again that the best place um, to receive care is, a, uh, is in a, a practice or a location that's already um, done a large number of the types of procedures that you're interested in having done. We know this for everything from neurosurgery to open heart surgery to even basic general surgery. Those programs that provide the best outcomes uh, and provide the most durable results are the programs that treat uh, the largest number of patients. And that comes uh, with experience, that comes with knowledge, that comes with an understanding of any potential complications that occur so that when and if that happens, there's a plan for that. It's something that that provider has seen before and it just becomes part of the normal course of caring for that patient. So I think first and foremost, whenever we're seeking healthcare and particularly procedural healthcare, it's most important to ask uh, how many of these have you done? What's your commitment to this? Is this your full-time practice? Is this your full-time passion and interest? If it's something that I practice, is this your full-time passion and interest? If it's something that is not any one of those things, I think one has to take a step back and ask themselves, is that, um, is that the practice in which I want to receive care? I would like to go to the experts in deep venous disease or uh, iliac um, outflow obstruction or pelvic uh, venous insufficiency, all these terms uh, being similar. I want to go to a practice that, that makes this uh, their passion. And at the Center for Vascular Medicine, this is our passion. This is the vast majority of what we do in our practice. It's something that we've studied. It's something that we've learned a whole lot about and we continue to learn. Um, but it's something that we've dedicated our, our profession to, and uh, I, I think that's why um, I would be comfortable myself or having any one of my family members or my friends be treated in our practice, just given the, the knowledge and experience that we've developed over the last decade. I like it. What happens when there is no improvement in patient uh, symptoms after the procedure? So, you know, again, a great question. Um, I, I would like to think that that happens fairly uncommonly. Uh, and I think it goes back to the question before in terms of where should you seek to receive care. I think that the initial um, process of evaluation is so important in terms of selecting patients that we believe that do have this, um, this anomaly and that will, be, that will benefit from intervention. And so all of that to say that if we choose our patients correctly based on again, the knowledge and experience that we've had of who benefits from this, uh, and we choose people correctly, then the instance uh, uh, that you're, you're speaking of with really not a lot of improvement uh, should be fairly uncommon. Uh, but to answer your question, if, if that does occur, uh, next steps would be to, again, evaluate any other common causes of lower extremity or pelvic discomfort. Again, evaluate any other common causes of lower extremity or pelvic discomfort. Uh, probably, you know, one of the first places we would start would be muscular skeletal involving the spine and the nervous system. Um, and, you know, again, in our practice, that is very uncommon. But if it does occur, we do have relationships with other uh, uh, specialists, other providers and other specialties. And we would work on uh, a treatment plan or a care plan collaboratively to make sure that that patient um, ultimately finds an answer and, and gets the relief that they deserve. What is the iliac vein? So we have a, uh, a deep vein system, uh, and, we're, and we're focusing on the lower extremities and on the pelvis, but we have a deep vein system throughout our body. Our vein's job is to drain blood, drain used up blood out of the extremities, back up to the heart and the lungs for it to be recharged and then sent back out uh, to the body through the arterial system. So the, the venous system is nothing more than a drainage system. The deep veins in the legs course up, uh, up the leg uh, into the pelvis, they coalesce at the point of the belly button to form a large deep vein called the inferior vena cava, which then comes and uh, brings the blood back to the heart and the lungs. So the iliac vein is the vein that is um, associated with the iliac crest of our pelvis. That's why we, we call it that. And uh, it's located in the groin, uh, maybe in the pelvis, um, you might say. And that's the vein in particular that, uh, particularly in the case of what we call May Thurner syndrome, is the vein that's most, uh, particularly in the case of what we call May Thurner syndrome, is the vein that's most commonly uh, associated with compression. That compression typically occurs from an outside force uh, on top of the vein that's compressing the vein, and in this case, it's the artery. The artery and the vein and the pelvis travel pretty closely together, and the artery sits on top of the vein and it can compress the vein. Uh, 
these structures are located actually they're they're uh, much uh, more located towards our back and so uh, this vein this common iliac vein typically sits right on top of the, the top of the spine and so you have the the spine bone you have the vein and then you have the artery coursing over the top of it and because the artery is a very strong muscular structure and the vein is very thin and weak walled mainly because it's, it's not carrying a high pressure fluid uh, that artery can just pulsate uh, every time the heart beats and compress that that vein between itself and the bone in the back and once that vein becomes compressed you begin to have drainage issues um, that's why a lot of times um, symptoms can also be associated with drainage issues um, that's why a lot of times um, symptoms can also be associated with leg symptoms of swelling and so when you have drainage issues either out of the legs or from the pelvis that's what leads to the discomfort the pain the heaviness uh, and all the other symptoms that are associated with this uh, with this this anomaly. So how it's treated is basically you just open up that vein. So, yeah. So again, if the if the common iliac vein uh, is and, and again it's more commonly compressed on the left side, uh, it's about four times more commonly compressed on the left side than it is the, the right side according to the literature we have. Um, when it's compressed, it's compressed because the artery is sitting on top. So if we insert a, a venous stent there, which kind of props that, that vein open and doesn't allow the artery to compress it over the top, uh, that reestablishes the drainage or the outflow out of the legs and the pelvis back up. And so there's no uh, retention of that, that blood or that fluid and, and the symptoms begin to improve as a result of that. It's interesting and, and the symptoms begin to improve as a result of that. It's interesting because if you consider what are some of the symptoms associated with uh, pelvic congestion syndrome in women in particular, uh, it has to do with these, these pelvic symptoms that occur uh, commonly towards the end of the day after having uh, stood or sat all day, uh, also during menstrual cycle, also during and particularly after intercourse. And if we think about what the commonality of all those activities is, is that whether we're standing and sitting throughout the day, the, the blood is actually being forced down into the lower extremities in the pelvis by gravity, so it's not able to drain out. So we get a little bit more of a, a fluid burden uh, throughout the day. And then during our menstrual cycle and during sexual activity, uh, sexual excitation, there's more blood flow to the pelvis. So there's more blood flow to the pelvis during the menstrual cycle, and there's actually a lot more blood flow to the pelvis during, during sex, during sexual excitation. And so the blood is able to uh, course into those tissues normally because there's nothing wrong with the arterial system in this case, but as they go to drain out, because the venous system is compromised, because that the arterial system in this case, but as they go to drain out, because the venous system is compromised, because that drain is more narrow than it should be, all the symptoms occur because of that. So when we think about uh, what are the common symptoms associated with this disease, uh, it's all about the retention of that fluid in the pelvis or in the lower extremities. I know that some other practices, they immediately go into embolization and before they do a uh, venous stent. Um, so what research that um, the Center for Vascular Medicine have done to you know justify their approach versus all the other approaches? So I think what you're referring to is the treatment of pelvic congestion syndrome. Uh, and it is absolutely true that in the, in the past, the common wisdom was that the way to treat uh, pelvic congestion syndrome or treat these you know, varicos, uh, varicosities or these varicose veins in the, in the pelvis and the abdomen uh, is to treat them with, um, with embolization. In other words, to inject a chemical or to use a, a device, a coil, to, to have that vein, um, uh, to shut down that vein. And, and have that vein not be in use anymore. And that was the common wisdom for uh, a long period of time. And what we've learned over time and, and what we've published um, in peer-reviewed journals is that our experience over time and, and what we've published um, in peer-reviewed journals is that our experience has been that chemical embolization, while it can sometimes be effective for a period of time, is not uh, is nearly as durable in terms of symptom relief as uh, addressing the primary cause of that congestion, uh, which is that um, which is that narrowing that happens in the pelvic vein, and by addressing that narrowing in the pelvic vein first, you get uh, more significant relief and you get a longer-lasting result um, by by addressing that directly. So, you know, in our practice at this point, the uh, amount of uh, chemical embolization or embolization of the pelvic veins that we do is very little. Uh, and instead, we rely on primarily uh, venous stenting as the best outcome. And again, we've published that in peer-reviewed journals. Uh, we had a, a study published in 2018 
um, with a fairly significant number of patients in it. And we're just about to update uh, that study again with a, a much larger uh, subset of patients. And we're just about to update uh, that study again with a, a much larger uh, subset of patients. Um, I think, you know, to, to touch on a question that, that you asked earlier in terms of where should I seek care, I think it's also important to, to recognize that in medicine, we are constantly learning, we're constantly evolving, and as we learn, if we share that information with, uh, with the community, with our colleagues, uh, with our peers, uh, that is very much a, a sign that we are, uh, we've made this our passion. And so I think it's uh, uncommon to find a practice that has published data as extensively, extensively as we have. And I think that goes to show our commitment and our passion in this field and in, in, in pelvic venous insufficiency.